Thanks, Neharika, for that introduction. And uh, welcome everyone on the digital edition of the Chandigarh Literati 2020 on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. I have with me today Oliver Krask, who is joining us all the way from London. Thank you, Oliver, for making the time to speak with us today. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, Swati. Uh, it's, it's morning here in London, so I'll say good morning as well. Yes, absolutely. Good morning to you. And it's my absolute privilege to be speaking with Oliver today about his latest book, The Indian Sun, which talks about the life and music of Pandit Ravi Shankarji. Uh, Oliver, I'm sure after listening to the introduction and after listening to the fact that you've written a biography on Pandit Ravi Shankarji, the maestro who does not need any further introduction from my end, as George Harrison had rightly labeled him, the godfather of world music, and uh, India today once called him Pat Sadhu, Pat Playboy. Uh, my first question to you uh, to direct us into this discussion would be, how did your tryst with Indian classical music start? And, and how was your association with Pandit Ravi Shankarji? How did that all begin? Well, I first met uh, Pandiji in 1994. Um, mm -hmm. As your colleague was saying, I was working in publishing. I was uh, uh, a young editor, basically, and I had a, just a great moment of fortune. I was working for a very interesting publishing company called Genesis, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, my boss was a, a wonderful man, Brian Roylance, who was a great friend of George Harrison and had also published him. So he had the introduction to, to uh, Revigi, and um, they had agreed to publish um, uh, Revigi's book, Ragamala, which was his, his final autobiography. And I, I for some reason, uh, had this wonderful opportunity to go and work with him on it and to actually help him compile the text. And uh, I, I'm not quite sure what I'd done to deserve this. I, I mean, I was very interested in Indian music, but I can't say I was an expert of any sort. Um, so by some you know, wonderful uh, opportunity of uh, fate, I, 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 uh, I managed to, to land this dream job. And uh, the thing was that he was, he was a completely fascinating person. Um, I met him first mm -hmm. of all home in California. And, um, you know, he sort of brought you into his world. I mean, we, 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 obviously we clicked. We got on very well. Absolutely. Um, I would say he was very easy to get on with um, because he had a great warmth and charisma and, uh, you know, he was so much fun as well. And also I sense the real depth to his uh, knowledge and his life experience and, you know, mm -hmm. just the list of extraordinary things he had done and achieved and seen in his life um, made him completely fascinating to me. Um, and as I said, again, it, it, was, it, was, it was fun. So, really, uh, uh, you know, I had a very privileged introduction to, to his world and, um, you know, to be able to see Indian music through his eyes as well. So, um, uh, uh, to cut a long story short, um, <laughs> we produced that book um, that was published back in 1997, but I always stayed in touch with him. Um, I felt a, a very strong bond and a very great interest in his his life and, and in India as well. Um, it probably helped that I had um, a Bengali girlfriend um, who's now <laughs> my wife. Eases things a little, doesn't it? Yeah, who's now my wife. Also um, you and, also mentioned. Think, uh, sorry, go on. Sorry, you also mentioned in your book that uh, Pandiji, in fact, encouraged you uh, in in the role to be his future biographer. So, yeah. how did those tips and tricks come about? It was it was a sort of subtle role, I think, probably because we uh, made a good connection. But he kept updating me on his life, and he would tell me things uh, sometimes and say, uh, for example, when we were working on Ragmala. Um, uh, you know, there was a sense of certain things that could come out after he died, you know, that, uh, that he felt it was difficult to say while he was alive. Um, but I, I would say that he, he encouraged me in that role. Yes, I, I slightly resisted it um, for some years. Um, having done that book, I didn't feel that it mm -hmm. was time to suddenly embark on another one. But, um, I, you know, I always sort of had it in mind, uh, something to do. But um, obviously he died in 2012. So this is something that I only really embarked on uh, after he died um, formally. Right. 
and uh, it was only then commissioned by Faber um, later. Um, but he definitely had sort of put me in that role. Um, and uh, also his his family were being tremendously helpful and cooperative on this mm -hmm. book. He had a, a wonderful archive, which I was able to go through all the sort of letters and papers and documents. Um, as, as, and I also interviewed um, uh, about 130 different people who um, wow. he, uh, you know, were close to him, family members, uh, some of whom hadn't been interviewed before, um, disciples, and then, you know, many friends from musical worlds and other worlds. So there's a great sort of process of re-examining his life. And uh, um, I found it's, you know, it's a different thing to do to write a biography about somebody else as opposed to helping somebody to write their own biography. Obviously, it gave Absolutely. me a great head start, but you have a different position. You have everyone else's perspective and you're looking for um, objectivity. And, and this almost leads me to, to the next question that uh, I'm sure many of us would have on our mind. Uh, depicting the grandeur of somebody like uh, Panditji in his biography, and kind of uh, stringing in the, the many associations that he had globally. Uh, what kind of uh, mental uh, frame of mind would a writer have to be in to ensure that there is no bias and, and everything is, is projected with the objectivity and, and with the confidence that perhaps uh, the interviewees had put into you? Uh, well, the, the kind of qualities you need would certainly need some courage um, to take on uh, such incredible large life. Um, uh, but I, I, I think that one has to be conscious that, you, you know, there are always biases in the way that one looks at any subject. And I had to be conscious of the fact that I found him a, a wonderful, fascinating person. Mm -hmm. and so I have a natural bias towards him. So I, I felt, for example, when I was... Um, interviewing other people, or in particular, people who couldn't be interviewed, perhaps because they were no longer around. Right. Um, but one had to try and think of, of how they might have seen an episode and to try and get some distance. And I think that he himself, actually, he understood that. He, there's a lovely quote. Um, he, he said, um, actually, when An An Anushka, his daughter, did a, mm -hmm. a, a, a lovely little memoir uh, about 20 years ago, he said, you know, how, how, how can you tell the the whole truth about me while I'm still alive you should wait till I'm dead and gone and then you know then you can be you tell the full story so I think he was he was very intelligent like that he understood that uh you know so much about how people's life stories are told and so on and uh so um yeah I think you know one has to th be aware of those kind of natural biases that one might have uh in order to try to resist them and get some kind of perspective because I think also it's really important it, not to be writing hagiography, especially about somebody who's really an important historical figure. And I think that by writing uh, as honestly as we can, then we, we do justice to the subject much more. And that's something that I know that he understood. So that kind of gave me the confidence in some ways to take on what's a very different, difficult task uh, to tell such a big story. I mean, it's such a long, busy, incredibly, action-packed life right from his childhood uh, you know he was a child star of a dancer back in the 1930s and and a young musician and the whole story of learning from his guru Alauddin Khan um, uh, you know all all of that from way back in the 30s and the 40s and uh, and it you know it parallels the whole history of India in the 20th century as well it was something I was very struck by you know, he keeps cropping up at these um, extraordinary moments in, in uh, national and, and indeed in global history. You know, he was a witness to so much. Um, uh, it made it a wonderful story to tell, but it also meant that you had, there was, you know, so much to get in there and you wanted to try and Absolutely. make sure there was a, a It's like trying to capture an ocean in, in the palm of your hand. I'm, yeah. I'm sure it must have been a daunting task for yeah. you. And, mm -hmm. and speaking about all of his experiences uh, globally, internationally, there's this one particularly that uh, I'd like to speak to you of, and especially because it 
this occasion has its 50th uh, year anniversary next year in August. Mm. I'm sure most of us would be aware about uh, the Bangladeshi liberation struggle of the 1970-71, where Panditji collaborated with George Harrison. Uh, could you tell us a little more about uh, where the whole compassion for that struggle came about for Panditji? Was it uh, from his memories as a child seeing the India partition? Where did that? I, 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 I do think that was part of it. Um, I mean, he was a Bengali, of course, and right. uh, his father was from East Bengal. Um, and of course, his guru was also, Aladdin Khan was also from East Bengal. He felt, you know, although he was born in Varanasi, so he was a Pravasi Bengali, um, he always felt that was a very important identity um, for him. You know, he, 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 he seems to have kind of balanced being a Bengali and being an Indian. After all, he right. changed his name to Ravi. You know, he was, he was Robi or, or Robu, Robindra, mm -hmm. childhood. And uh, when he first started playing on All India Radio, he changed his name to Ravi because he wanted to be a sort of All Indian figure. That was very much his ambition. Yet the Bengali part of him was very important. He had, uh, you know, many, many Bengali friends. Um, uh, uh, his first wife was Bengali. Uh, and he always you know, stayed in contact uh, with what was going on in Calcutta and, and, and West Bengal. And um, so I think that when the, this flared up in 1970, there was, uh, the terrible cyclone and all the yes. um, you know, humanitarian disaster, uh, which was um, almost exactly 50 years ago now, and then followed by all the oppression in 1971, um, he was, he was uh, at the time he was um, in uh, California when he was reading about the stories mm -hmm. for the most part. Uh, th at that time he had a home there. Um, but he was, you know, reading the reports and he was becoming very, very worried about it. He, uh, partly he had personal connections. He had distant relatives who were uh, refugees from what was going on there. But partly okay. the humanitarian feeling and, and, and fellow feeling for Bengalis. And um, uh, I mean, many people were, you know, obviously incredibly uh, moved by it, but he did something about it. Mm -hmm. Because he started thinking what I do as an artist. He was thinking about, I'd like to put on a, a fundraising concert or something like that to bring attention. Um, but, you know, he knew that he could only do so much. He, by this time, he was a world famous figure, but he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't, there'd be a limit to what he could do. Um, but he, uh, in, in the, I think in June of 1971, he played a, a recital at his home in uh, Los Angeles. Um, mm -hmm. And George Harrison was present, and he told him at that um, on that occasion about what was going on and uh, the suffering, and and you know his idea that he might um, put on a concert. And George Harrison, to his enormous credit, he understood just how much this meant to uh, Raviji, and uh, he he volunteered to take on you know to, to to help him, and he sort of took on the big organisational role of. Um, arranging what became the concert for Bangladesh, uh, which took place in August um, in yes. 71 in Madison Square Garden in New York. And um, uh, so this became a very famous concert. It was, you know, a, a, uh, there was a number one album and a movie of the album. And, and but immediately, even before those came out, it, it brought a lot of attention to the to what had happened. It was the you know, it was, it was, this was a, a, a year after the Beatles had split up, and so yes. anything that George Harrison did was going to be um, high profile. And he understood that he could use that profile to benefit a really important cause, and that was yes. it. So uh, overnight, you know, the world was hearing um, all about um, uh, the suffering of the, the, the refugees and um, what was going on, and just brought world attention to it. So there was, uh, you know, I think a fantastic, thing that they did together and um, a great humanitarian uh, response. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree less. And uh, speaking of his collaboration with, with global stars and uh, putting things uh, on the world map, so to speak, as far as uh, Indian classical music is concerned, uh, I read a very interesting reference in your book uh, about uh, foreigners 
thinking of Indian classical music as a maze of noises. This was mentioned somewhere in, in a passage to India. And um, also there was a time when, when Panditji was uh, called the, the Indian sun rising in the West. Uh, while interrogating his life and work, uh, how fair do you think this, this caption would, would suit him? The Indian sun rising in the West. I, I I rather resist that. I I, I feel that um, that was actually a headline in in the Times of India in uh, 1997 on, on the 50th anniversary of independence, and um, I feel and, and I you know I say this as a as a British person as an outsider, but mm -hmm. one who spent plenty of time in India and you know has really immersed myself in uh, Ravi Shankar's life. I feel that. Um, you know, he, he had this tremendously stratospheric fame um, as a result of his overseas success, you know. Right. And of course, he's best known for that, that friendship with George Harrison and for playing at the Monterey, Woodstock festivals, and of course, Bangladesh. And that kind of influence he had on popular culture and, and making uh, people around the world aware of Indian classical music. And also it's it's other cultural aspects, it's dance, it's um, spirituality, it's it's uh, clothing, it's incense sticks, whatever. I mean, it, it, he really sort of gave it an enormous um, boost. Um, but I, I think that, you know, I can say this, I, I felt from my research that India has slightly forgotten um, what a big star he was in India and how, what an impact he had in India before that. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, was, it wasn't an accident that he was the person who was there um, becoming this, you know, this um, global figure. He, he, but he first started touring abroad seriously in 1956. So that's a whole decade before he met George Harrison. And the reason was that he was, he was a big star in India. And he'd done so much to raise the profile of Indian classical music within India. Uh, I, I focused particularly on his role at All India Radio, where he was director of music from 1949. So shortly after independence, and at a time when radio was actually only just starting to boom in India, um, it was quite it was booming quite late. It was the first big wave of um, uh, radio spreading around um, the country, and it took independence yes, exactly. to do that. Mm -hmm. um, the British didn't really invest in it, um, but the, in, you know India, as soon as independence came, they started. Um, spreading radio around the country. And as director of music, he was in an important role uh, to, to uh, promote um, music. And he did so not only his own performance, I mean, he became a star, really, um, principally through that, I, I feel, in India, through radio. Um, although he was already known for, you know, he was already acclaimed for performer and, um, and uh, uh, composer as well. Um, but yes. radio gave him such a big boost. And, and then he also, what he did was he, he, as director of music, he, he was a kind of gatekeeper who could showcase all these different types of music from all around the country. You know, he was very connected with Carnatic music as well as Hindustani, mm -hmm. and also folk music from various uh, uh, parts of the country. And he liked to showcase this on the radio. He liked to, uh, and I think it was showing Indians that, you know, this is, you know, immediately after independence and the end of the, the colonial era, that, you know, India has all these incredible art forms and you know, we should be proud of them. And I think that that was a really important message to put across at that time. Um, and and really just, you know, revealing the incredible riches from all around the country. Uh, and radio being new, this, this, was, mm -hmm. this was a new thing to most of the listeners because you didn't have mass media of that kind beforehand. You, you would typically, if you were interested in classical music, you might know your more local musicians from your local, school. Yeah. You know, particular Harana or, um, so I think he had a really important role there. And that's, I noticed, you know, I could see that in the, for example, the newspaper cuttings and so on and, and uh, interviews that uh, I collected um, on that period. Um, so I feel that, um, yes, I, you know, I, I feel that India had slightly forgotten that, that he was an Indian star first, mm -hmm. or Indian star first. So I, you know, I do think the sun rose in the East first, uh, before <laughs> it rose in the West, even if it rose higher in the West, maybe later on. Um, but I think it's very important. I don't think you can really understand him properly without 
understanding how deep those uh, you know, his roots and connections. Uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. No, uh, I'm, I'm sure all of us as Indians are, are extremely proud of Pandaji and uh, what he has done for our music, uh, not only locally, but globally as well. Um, I'm sure a lot of research and, and many years of work and interrogation must have gone into this biography. Uh, Oliver, you must have met a lot of people, seen uh, a lot of things that perhaps will never reach the public eye. Uh, just out of curiosity and for a wider audience to know, while we know Pandaji uh, in the shape and form of dance and music, uh, was there any other thing that he was passionate about or had an inkling or liking to other than uh, this form of creativity? Any yeah. other subject close to his heart, perhaps? Yes, I think. Uh, I mean, he he was tremendously curious person about ev you know everything. Um, uh, I, I mean, I've, you know, I, I, on a on a completely sort of a mundane level, I can remember, for example, um, uh, once meeting him in in, in the UK, and I, I suppose we were, we were working together on something, and then. You know what he would he would do that he said, said we'd finish the session he said well now I, I need to go for my my you know daily exercise or something so we went for a walk around the local mall and and I, you know I went with him and we continued talking and and he would be constantly sort of pointing out what was in the windows or wanting to pop into certain shops and there's this sort of endless curiosity about um, uh, all the sort of you know the, our creativity as as a species and and, and what was the, the the latest thing or um, and um, I don't think it could take all kinds of forms. He was he was a great film nut, for example. Oh really? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, he 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 absolutely adored it. You know, from right back uh, in his childhood, and um, uh, you know, he used to love all these old Hollywood films from the nineteen thirties, and that was a lifelong passion. <laughs> um, That's interesting. And, yeah, and I, I remember in you know in his home in uh, California when I first met him. This is the 1994 there was a great big um flat screen television um mm -hmm. and you know, he would have sort of movie evenings and um watching uh all kinds of things i mean indian movies certainly but also i don't know holly, holly the latest hollywood films I, I can remember him watching jim carrey and dumb and dumber and you know being absolutely um, um <laughs> finding very um there's a lovely human side to him like that he, you know there's so much fun you know uh, he loved food, you know. I mean, I mean, what some of the, the the nicest moments I can remember would be, you know, we would maybe we would work together in you know in the morning, and then we would stop for lunch, and I would be you know invited to come and join them for lunch, and uh, you, you know all this wonderful ho home cooked food that um, Sukanya, his his wife, his second wife, mm -hmm. was a wonderful cook, um, and um, so just to be able to sit at the at the table or at the you know the, the kind of counter with him and sharing lunch together. Uh, you know, that, uh, it's lovely to see somebody from those sides as well. Yeah, absolutely. It gets such a humane aspect mm. to to what otherwise to us will will always be a mystery. Mm. And uh, it it was it was lovely speaking to you, Oliver. And uh, I'm I'm sure this discussion, conversation, chat will uh, intrigue people encourage people to go out there and get the copy of the Indian Sun to know more about the life of uh, Pandaji. Uh, thank you for being such a lovely audience and thank you Oliver for speaking with us today. Thank you so much Lady. Thanks.